Welcome, everyone. We'll start in just a couple, another minute or two as we wait for people to arrive. Thanks for joining us. Well, I think we'll begin. Hello, and welcome to today's first Nurture Connection webinar titled Nurture Connection Presents Early Relational Health Research Principles and Perspectives. Thank you all for joining us today as we lift up two powerful reports that demonstrate early relational health in action and practice. The Burke Foundation's Early Relational Health, a review of research principles and practice perspectives, and Nurture Connection State Leadership policy action to advance early relational health. Today, we're gonna to take a deep look at the Burke Foundation's Early Relational Health Principles Report and share a teaser of the Nurture Connection State Policy Report that has been co-authored by Kay Johnson. We will host a detailed webinar early next year on the State Policy Report, so keep an eye out for what will be coming forth about that registration and link. Today, you're gonna to hear from a variety of perspectives to today's webinar, including Lavanya Abavano, who represents a parent voice, Monique Fantanhana, representing the systems level voice, Kay Johnson, co-author of the State Leadership Report, Shen Lei Li, co-author of the Early Relational Health Principles Report, and Husha Ramachandran, representing the clinician voice and moderator. My name is David Willis. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Social Policy, and I'm the founder of Nurture Connection, a network and engaged movement promoting early relational health. I imagine that most of you are familiar with early relational health, but to put it simply, it is the state of emotional well-being that grows from positive connections between babies and their parents, caregivers, and the surrounding community. Nurture Connection envisions a future where every family experiences the joy and benefits of strong, positive, and nurturing relationships, we do this by engaging a variety of voices and expertise, from parents and caregivers, to doctors and doulas, to policymakers and researchers. Just another example of how we are engaging and growing our network of people who are committed to building healthier communities through the power of connection and relationships. I'm now pleased to hand this over to our partner, Atia Weiss, Executive Director of the Burke Foundation, who released the Early Relational Health Principles Report that we're going to be focused on today. Atiyah? Thank you so much, David, and thank you for your tireless advocacy for incorporating early relational health into our work. Many thanks to Nurture Connection for hosting this fantastic panel discussion. As Executive Director of the Burke Foundation, we were honored to sponsor Junle Li, Thelma Ramirez, and their co-authors in developing this important new re resource on early relational health. And we are excited to share its messages near and far. We see early relational health as foundational to our work on behalf of families during the critical first 1,000 days from pregnancy through age two. Those connections between babies and toddlers and their caregivers have both immediate and long-term benefits for both physical and mental health for the children as well as their caregivers. Much of the work that we do at the Burke Foundation is focused on relieving the stress on families that can interfere with their ability to connect and bond. From improving the birth experiences for mothers, to advocating for more affordable childcare, to supporting paid family leave for working families. And the report's recommendations emphasize the valuable role of many systems that are already in place, from nonprofits through social service agencies, working together to build an interwoven system of support for the early relational health of babies, young children, and their families. But stress is inevitable, and early relational health, as the new report so clearly illustrates, can be an effective preventative measure, giving children and adults the reserves and confidence to overcome adversity. So it is, in a sense, an investment in the future health of generations. I don't want to steal his thunder, but Jun Lee Li makes a critical point. If we focus only on the children, we are missing half the story. 
Early relational health is a vital component for building a cycle of opportunity across generations and changing the trajectory of families. I hope today's session will bring us closer together toward this shared goal. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Usha Ramachandran, and member of the Nurture Connection Steering Committee. Usha is a general pediatrician, member of the Nurture Connection Steering Committee, and professor of pediatrics at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Thank you all. Thank you so much for that introduction, Atiya, and a big thank you to you and the Burke Foundation for all the work that you do in supporting young children and families and for centering early relational health and all the work that you do. It is my pleasure to be moderating today's uh, Nurture Connection webinar, which is focused on um, early relational health research principles and perspectives. We have a really exciting group of speakers lined up for you today. Um, just a few housekeeping points before we get started. Uh, the, mute, the chat function is muted for participants, um, but you can enter your questions into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we will do our best to answer your questions as we go along, but um, we might also save some of your questions for the Q&A section, which will happen at the very end of the, uh, the webinar. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, if you are, you know, your sound or your video doesn't work, do not worry. We will be um, uploading the, the video and a transcript on uh, the nurtureconnection.org website. Um, so having said that, um, I want to start off by um, just giving you a quick uh, summary of my uh, journey to ERH. Um, so I'm, uh, as Atia mentioned, I'm a general pediatrician, and throughout my career, I have provided primary pediatric care to children um, and a very diverse community at a federally qualified health center in New Jersey. And at, when I was a very young pediatrician, you know, I always understood and recognized that the relationships, the strength of the relationships that children have with the adults around them were really important. I recognized that from day one. I wish I could say that because I recognized the importance from day one, that from day one, I also supported families in those relationships. But the truth of the matter is that in the early part of my career, I was way more focused on picking up problems, addressing problems, because those were the skills that I had. That's what my medical education had given me the skills to do. But as I went through my career and as I built stronger relationships with families, it became really clear to me that as important as the other things that I was doing in primary care were, you know, the immunizations matter, the nutrition advice, monitoring growth and development, all of that mattered. But if I could not address some of the day-to-day -day challenges and some of the barriers that my families were facing, I was not gonna make as much of a difference as I had hoped to make. Um, and so I started to look for evidence-based strategies to address some of those challenges that families were facing. And one of these strategies that I came across was the Reach Out and Read program. Um, this is a evidence-based program that aims to give all children a foundation for success by promoting shared reading through well-child visits. So we adopted that program at my side. We started to give out culturally developmentally appropriate books that every well-child visit, talk about, talk with parents about, you know, how they can have joyful shared reading um, woven into their daily routines and so on. Um, and although the goal initially was all about giving kids a foundation for development and school readiness, the more I did this in the exam room with families, the more I recognized that the magic really lay in, you know, those moments of connection and engagement that happened in the exam room when parents and children shared that moment of connection together around the book. Um, and just witnessing those moments of magic was so uplifting to me as well. And I felt that it brought me a little bit closer to, to the families that I was working with as well. And so when I heard the term early relational health, um, you know, a few years ago, it really resonated with me because I realized that this was talking exactly about what I had been thinking about as those moments of magic, 
that were happening. Um, and so I was immediately drawn to sort of embark on this journey of learning how I could support families in, you know, in, in, in strengthening this early relational health for every child. Um, the most significant thing about this journey for me has been that this has involved really learning, truly learning from parents and truly learning how to partner authentically with families and communities and systems as well. Um, so it's a journey that I'm still on and I'm still really uh, cherishing. The AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2021, put out a policy statement that encouraged or really exhorted all of our, all pediatricians to partner with families and communities to promote early relational health. And as I've spoken to pediatricians across the state and across the country uh, about this, I realize that this resonates with a lot of us in, in clinical practice. And as we embark on these journeys of trying to put this into practice in those one-on-one -on -one interactions we have with families in exam rooms, a lot of other questions have, have come up in terms of how do we frame ERH? How do we actually practically weave these, you know, this promotion and strengthening of ERH into the work that we already do? And this is where, when I read the report that was put out by the Burke Foundation and co-authored by um, Jin Lei Li, who's here with us today, I was really struck by the clarity of that framing, the, uh, and the simplicity and, and yet the powerful way in which those principles of ERH were laid out and also those practical ways to weave those principles into what we're doing. And it's especially for me and for other people in practice, how to weave it into practice. So I think this is something that can be really useful to everyone else um, in healthcare as well. And as an educator, um, I wanna see all medical students, but especially those that are going into fields like pediatrics and family medicine, start their medical education with a firm understanding of these principles, and then build all the other learning that they do in pediatrics upon this firm foundation of relational, collaborative, strengths-based care. Um, so with that, um, I would like to um, turn it over to the co-author of, uh, of this powerful report, Dr. Jin Lei Li. Um, um, uh, Dr. Lee is a Saul uh, Zan Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Dr. Lee teaches about improving human interactions and supporting helpers, delivers keynote addresses and workshops for child-serving professionals nationally and internationally, and serves on boards and advisory panels, including Child Care Aware of America, Parents as Teachers, the Terrell Fund, and various other initiatives at the U.S. Administration for Children and Families. His research and practice focuses on understanding and supporting the work of helpers, those who serve children and families on the front lines of education and social services. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the baton over to Dr. Jin Lei Li. Thank you, Usha. And it's a pleasure to join uh, all of you and um, um, what I'm about to share is very much informed by the many people that we have interviewed in the course of developing this report with the sponsorship of the Burke Foundation, including many of our panelists here today. Um, but I don't want to use this particular time to kind of go through the details of the report. The report is shared in the link, but I do want to um, echo Usha and David and Atiyah on this idea of early relational health and what it could do for all of us. And what Usha just said is the same impression that I had. So early relational health was a new term for me when I first heard it about five years ago. And it might struck many of you who might be hearing it recently or for the first time that First, when you hear about this term, you, you, you wonder kind of what is it about? But then within minutes, you're like, oh, yes, I know what this is. <laughs> this is this has been part of my work for so long. And that there, there's something so important, right, about this feeling about we know this all along, <laughs> whether we are a, pro a professional, whether we are a parent, that this is something that has been very much part of who we are 
as people who care about children, who people who care for children, for families. And so what I hope to share today is this idea of how early relational health can help us can help us to complete this big picture that for years that we have been building about this healthy ecosystem that surrounds early childhood and everyone that's in it. And speaking of picture, I wonder if um, any of you are scrambling to do something that I do usually around this time of the year. I'm just flipping through my phones, trying to find pictures that I can add to the holiday card. And one of the things, particularly for parents of young children, is it, it's no problem to find pictures for your kids. Like your, your phone is full of pictures of your kids or your pets or whatever. But one of the things that my wife always asks me to do for these cards is, can you just find a picture of, of us, of us as a family with the adults? And that turns out to be almost impossible <laughs> over all these years, because it's usually the caregiver, it's usually the adults who are actually taking the pictures. You're never in the pictures. And most of us are too old to get into the selfie habit. So we have a phone full of pictures of our children and none of our, 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 ourselves. I mentioned that in part because I think this serves as almost a metaphor of how we have been talking and thinking about early childhood. That we're so focused on the children that we're serving that often our stories, our pictures leave out the people that are most important in the lives of children, whether they are parents or whether they're other care providers. And when we think about the kind of stories, right, that we have been telling about early childhood from thinking about brain development, how much the brain develops in, in early child, childhood, when we think about all the adversities that surrounds child, children and how that impacts their health and their resilience over time, when we think about arguments from, you know, Nobel laureates, thinking about return on investments, in each of these kind of frames and ways of thinking, they all capture something really important about early childhood. But I think these stories told about the work of early childhood at best captures, let's say, half of the picture, just the way that our pictures, our phones capture half of our family most of the time. What I'm so hopeful is that early relational health can help us to complete the picture, can close the loop, not just about early childhood, but can tell stories about things that actually happens inside the work of early childhood, whether it is caregiving day in and day out for parents at home, or whether it is in the context of the work in our communities and our professional practices. So I want to share just three thoughts about what is it about early relational health that can extend this half of the picture to a full picture of what is it that we do in early childhood. And it comes down to three things. The first thing is early relational health is by definition relational. <laughs> it is about relationship. It is not just about any one person. Why is that important? It seems so obvious. Why is it that we need to remind ourselves of that, remind each other of that? Well, think about the way we have talked about brain development, for example, in early childhood. We talk about brain development exclusively as something that happens inside the heads of infants and toddlers and young children, right? But if you were to enlarge that picture, you go, wait a minute, for that to happen, a lot of things that have to happen all around it. And uh, there's this beautiful principle in the science of human development that's just simply summarized as reciprocity. What reciprocity means is that if something is in interaction in relationship with each other, then whatever happens on one end of the relationship is reciprocally happening on the other end of the relationship. So in order to, un trying to understand the phenomenon on one end of the relationship, you need to understand what exactly is happening on the other end. So let's come back to brain development, something we've so used to thinking about just inside the head. Well, it turns out, that you, there's a lot to learn about brain development for caregivers, for parents, for adults, right? That if something is changing in the young child's brain, you can reciprocally expect that something is happening on the adult side as well. And it turns out, for example, for birth parents, 
even before the child is born, the brain, just as well as the rest of the body, start to change. And in the brain, it particularly changes in something that neuroscientists call the caregiving network. It's not any one part of the brain, it's this network across the entire brain from how we pay attention to how we feel to how we respond to signals. And all these things start to just turn on. It touches literally every part of the brain and it, it gets the parent ready for the kind of caregiving relational interactions that happens afterwards. So for pediatricians, for home visitors, for everyone who's ever embraced this idea of strength-based approach to parents, well, here's the neuroscience argument that affirms and recognizes why strength-based approaches are so important because it is actually there. For those of us, like me, who's an adoptive parent and who's also a dad, who wonders like, wait, what if I don't have this biological clock that helps me to turn on this caregiving brain? Well, it turns out that the research science is incredibly hopeful, right? So you have this process where the caregiving brain turns on to prepare you for caregiving interactions. But for those of us where, you know, it doesn't turn on so naturally, well, it turns out that just as reciprocity principle would say, what happens is that when you engage in caregiving interactions, when you hold the child, when you change the child's diaper, when you're with the child, well, that itself turns it on as well, that, that this process goes in a circle just, just by being part of caregiving, the caregiving network in our brain is strengthened. They find that with adoptive parents, they find that with fathers, they find that with everybody. So even just by taking this relational lens, right, to look at something as basic as brain development enlarges the picture, right, to understand that brain development is something that happens on both ends. And the fundamental principle here is that promoting early relational health have to start with both understanding the relational needs of the child, which is so intuitive to all of us, but at the same time to respect and support the relational caregiving capacity of the adult whether it is in their brain or whether it is in the way they hold the child or the way they talk to the child and so on. And that naturally lead to the second important idea within early relational health, which is that early relational health is ecological. And ecological just means that no individual <laughs> kind of develops in silo. They, 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 they develop in a system all around us. And traditionally in the field of child development, in the field of social work, we portray ecology in this kind of picture of concentric circles, often with the child in the middle. And that is one way to see it, but that isn't the only way to see that ecology. So one of the challenges of focusing with child at the center is that we, we, we invariably kind of turn our lens primarily to the child. So one of the things sometimes I like to know is, is I would type in a, a word like early childhood. I would type into Google image search right, to see what kind of images are typically associated with a concept. That sometimes tells you how the world out there understands the concept. Well, if you type in early childhood into Google image search, you get these pictures. And these pictures are lovely, but these pictures have a striking similarity to the pictures I'm going through on my phone right before the holidays. The important adults are missing from these pictures, even when you see them, they're on the periphery of it, right? And that is the limitation of thinking exclusively about the child as a center in an ecosystem. A while ago, I was talking to an actual environmental scientist and I was talking about, oh yes, in early childhood, we talk about ecosystem too. And I showed them that picture and the environmentalist was very interested, but asked me a question that just blew my mind. She said, you know, there's no center in an ecology. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, that's right. Like when we were kids, when, when we see these pictures of ponds and oceans in our biology books, there was no center, right? And, and the point of having no center is that the only way for every species in that ecosystem to be well is for every species in that ecosystem to be well. Ecosystem is not just about centers, it's actually about relationships. It's about healthy relationships between one and another throughout the system 
that underlies the health. So when the American of Academy of Pediatrics, along with other organizations within the last years kind of embraced the idea of early relational health, the message that I personally take away is summarized in the AAP's policy report, right? That, that these relationships are promoted in families that have these relationships, but families have to have access to these relationships within the community. That is an ecosystem of many, many different centers and many, many different relationships. So in early relational health, what that would look like is that we can think about this from multiple perspectives. If we think about it from the child's perspective, we can ask the question, what relational experience do children need? Well, families, of course, many other providers that come into the child's life, child care providers, professional providers, informal providers, extended family providers, and of course, their peers and their communities throughout. These are the relationships that a child is intimately involved with. But then if we see it from the perspective of a family, you think about the way the family goes through their days and weeks and years, and every family have a different journey, have a different path. But in order for that family, right, to strengthen the relational experiences in and around the family, well, they need to kind of cut across, right, all these different people that come into their lives from the healthcare sector, from the community spaces and community sectors, coming from the early childhood, education, early childcare, early intervention world, and of course, the family support, home visiting, the infant mental health, early childhood mental health world, and many, many other professionals. These are the support systems that helps the family. And then if we zoom out, right, we zoom out to not just one child, one family, but for children and families all across the community, then what you see is you have many centers that ripples out in the way they touch, they strengthen the relationship within the family and the relationship between these different centers, right, so that they might collaborate, they might work more effectively together. And so if we see early relational health as an ecology in this way with many centers, one of the most important things it help us to do is, in addition to advocate for children, we start to advocate for caring for the caring givers and helping the helping professionals. And, and the truth, it is in, as much in common sense as it is in research, is that none of us can possibly expect to make a lasting impact on children if we skip over the adults in the middle, the support they need, the care they need, the proper compensation and development that they need. And all of that leads to the final aspect of early relational health. I think it just warms my heart every time I talk about it. It's this idea that early relational health fundamentally paints a hopeful picture for all of us, for families, for children, for communities. For years, early childhood, we talked a lot about the impact of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. We talked about how that weighs down the child and weighs down their brain development, their physiology, and leads to lifelong challenges in mental health, physical health, and behavioral health. All these years, I feel like that's important, but we're missing clearly in this picture, we're missing something. Something has to counterbalance. And within the last five years, the public health researchers have coined the term positive childhood experiences or PACES, right? Something that can help to buffer and counter the impact of these adverse childhood experiences. And these PACES turn out to be very ordinary experiences that we can, we can have, we can develop for families and for children and for communities. And they rely on very simple experiences and questions in these public health surveys, like do people feel, do children feel safe and protected by adults in their homes? Do children feel like they can talk to their families about their feelings? Where their families stood by them during difficult times? Participating community cultural traditions. Feel like you belong, whatever age you are in school. Feel like you have friends, you're supported by them. And do you have at least two non-parental adults that have taken a genuine interest in them? And so all of that is to say that early relational health can finally close the loop, can help to complete this picture about early childhood with stories not just told about early childhood, but stories that can rise 
from the actual experience and work of early childhood, from parents, from care providers, from professionals who are so intimately involved in that support. And so the story to me essentially comes down to these basic ideas that all of us have known all along, but that we can be reminded of time and time again, that the foundation of human development begins in early childhood, that the foundation of physical, behavioral, and mental health is relational health, and that parent leaders, care providers, and educators, they are early childhood relational health professionals. And as a result, their collective work in early relational health is foundational to the well-being of every community everywhere. Let me just stop there, Usha. I'm going to hand this right back to you. Thank you so much, Jinlay, for that wonderfully eloquent presentation. Um, you know, the fact that you highlight all of us as foundational, uh, in addition to all the other great points that you made, I think, you know, feeling that the work we do is meaningful is such a great motivator. So for all of us to recognize the role that we play and the, you know, and the impact that we can have is so powerful. So thank you so much for all of that. I would now like to, uh, uh, introduce Kay Johnson, one of the co-authors of Nurture Connections, State Leadership and Policy Action to Advance Early Relational Health. Um, as David had mentioned earlier, we're giving a brief preview of that report today, but we will host another webinar um, early next year that will go into greater detail into that report. Um, Kay Johnson has become nationally recognized for her work in maternal and child health as a policy analyst, advocate, and consultant over the past 40 years. Reducing the impact of poverty and racism and increasing access to services for women, children, and their families have been two of her lifelong goals. Um, Kay has been active in Medicaid and EPSDT at the federal and state levels and has served as a consultant advisor to more than 45 states. Uh, regarding health policy. Currently, Kay is a senior member of and consultant to the Nurture Connection policy team. Kay Johnson. Thank you. I need this uh, slide to go down so I can uh, put my slide up. Thank you. Um, I am really delighted to be here to talk with you today. Um, I have found um, Really, I think all of us uh, appreciate uh, what Jun Lee has uh, given to us in, in a brilliant, succinct way. Um, and to really think about this, the ecosystem that Jun Lee showed us helps frame our policy and advocacy. We've been thinking about this for a couple of years. I'm going to show you a little bit about the policy agenda. And I really want to talk to you about why we see this the way that we do. So. We start from the perspectives that for too long, the nation has had policies, whether they're the economic, uh, income support, health, human services, early childhood education, and other early childhood policies, do not promote and support foundational early relationships between parents and young children. In many ways, they've been punitive. Occasionally, there's a little glimmer of hope, and then it seems to be pulled back. On top of that, we know that structural racism, poverty, and other systemic inequities have particular impact on the lives of families with young children. Young children are our poorest population. They are more likely to live in segregated, disinvested communities. They are more likely to be in contexts where their families are earning less, just starting out. And this deepens disparities and threatens positive outcomes and early relational health. So we know that policy change is needed. We set out a frame for our ERH policy goals that really aim to increase equity, economic security, provider training, services and evidence-based approaches that promote early relational health, a, a, a relational workforce, high-performing medical homes for children, both parent and infant and early childhood mental health services, and other aspects of the early childhood system. So we're thinking about an array of this. No one piece of legislation, no one programmatic approach is sufficient to assure that families have the resources and supports they need to build foundational early relationships and promote well-being. 
we've got to look across the board. And we also know that our current federal policy leaves gaps and it gives states broad discretion and authority to take action to support families. So we we have no, and I will repeat it, we have no universal child policies in the United States. Uh, we have approached them. We could not get a universal coverage policy. We could not get a universal immunization policy. We have uh, elapsed uh, more universal tax credit approach. We have no universal approaches. And many of the programs that we have intended to support families leave states to be the decision makers. So we set out to take through the lens of our agenda um, a look at what states are doing. And I'm very pleased to be the co-author with uh, Dr. David Willis and Jeff Nagel for this recently released report on state leadership and policy action to advance early relational health. Um, we're really grateful to the state leaders who gave their time uh, and ideas to this work, um, and you'll see a, a little more about them. The report offers many case studies from six states, and again, looking through the lens of our early relational health policy agenda, um, the headlines here really are about um, the uh, the areas that we've highlighted in each of these states, but in each of these states, they may have other aspects. So many of them have infant early childhood mental health initiatives, or they have doula policies, or they have Medicaid changes, or they have other changes that aren't reflected in the headlines. But we went to these states, starting with New Jersey, because they are advancing a broad initiative that promotes early relational health and systems and advance that in Oregon, they're leveraging measurement to understand where are children at risk and how we can support them. In Washington state, they're using Medicaid to improve both early relational health and infant and early childhood mental health and other provider as public provider partnerships. In California, they've moved upstream to finance services with Medicaid and Michigan with provider training and competencies related to early relational health. And in Vermont, accelerating early relational health through team-based high-performing medical homes with Dulce. I guess I would say an important aspect of this is that these aren't all called early relational health. It doesn't have to be labeled early relational health to have this supportive function. It's not a criteria we set out in our work. What we learned is that every state can better leverage income, health, mental health, early care and education, child welfare, and other policies that serve families with young children. We've also as an initiative committed to this being the time to partner with families and providers and communities to advance equity and strengthen early relational health through effective policy advocacy and implementation. We know there's an array of providers, whether you're a pediatrician, uh, a, a nurse home visitor, uh, a community health worker, a doula, an infant and early childhood mental health provider, all of those professionals think they have a key role to play in promoting foundational relationships and fostering child, child development and well being. Let's empower them with the principles of early relational health that June Lee talked to us about. Uh, we can reimagine and co design these services and these policies. In our report, in addition to the six studies, uh, we have a 50 state table that highlights 14 policy and program areas across health clusters of early racial health agenda. So the economic security and equity, we have the mental health cluster, we have the, the health and workforce together and early childhood systems cluster. You can see here the numbers of states and the headlines for the policies that we've highlighted. We're particularly grateful to the prenatal to three policy impact center, but others who keep track of what policies states adopt. Um, and I would say just if you look at this and you say, oh, my favorite thing, for example, your favorite thing might be home visiting and it's not on this list. That's because every state now has money to support um, uh, evidence-based home visiting, or you might have another favorite piece that where every state has money to support that thing. These are the levers, particularly for states that we want to emphasize and highlight. So with that, Usha, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, we will share registration details in the upcoming weeks for the next uh, webinar that will be held in early uh, the early part of next year that will go into greater detail on this report. Um, and coming back to the 
original report, the ERH principles report at hand. Um, I'd like to uh, bring in two other speakers today to lend their valuable voices and perspectives on this. Um, I'd like to introduce Monique Fontenhanna, who currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer and Advisor for Continuous Quality Improvement and Health Equity at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Maternal and Child Health Bureau's Federal Home Visiting Program. Monique also serves as a member of Nurture Connections Steering Committee. Lavanya Abavana is the proud mother of three amazing children and a, and a six-month-old granddaughter. She's a parent leader and advocate for policy change that supports families across New Jersey. Her work has been recognized by national, state, and local organizations. She's also an early relational health champion with the Burke Foundation and was closely involved in the creation of this report. So to start off with, I'd like to address a question to both of you. Um, could you both share what early relational health means to you? What brought you to this work? Um, uh, thank you, Usha, and thank you to the panelists um, beforehand. Um, Julie just has a wonderful way of just making things come to life. Um, I love his storytelling and his uh, analogies that he always uses. Um, but, but I really love this question about early relational health and, and, and really, for me, it's sort of pulling together of so many threads. I think you've heard that said um, so many times from, from many of us today that we've we've known in this field, no matter where we're coming into the field from, um, this idea of caregiver child interactions, um, but it's really a much more articulated and clear picture, especially if you hear Jun Lee um, share one of his um, analogies. You know, this, um, I remember when I was in medical school in my early years, um, similar to you, Usha, and I was preparing for my career, future career as a pediatrician, and I was enthralled by the, the um, videos um, by Dr. Terry Brazelton and, and how he was depicting sort of the early years and the, and the importance of those interactions. It was very clear from his work that caregivers mattered. I remember watching this one video and I can remember it very clearly. Um, the baby, um, the mother started talking and had the baby's face very close to hers. And the baby in response was cooing and making sounds that were very similar to what the mother was saying. And I was amazed by that video. Um, and it reminded me um, that connections happen early. Um, that they happen not only in this case, in a mother and an infant, but we know that those connections happen in utero and then across um, the early years as well. And for me as a young professional, it was enlightening, it was energizing. And I think as the years have progressed, I don't think, sort of like you, Usha, I'm not sure that I took full advantage and leaned into that. But I think throughout my public health career as a public health clinician, um, I've been able to leverage that knowledge in the many ways that it's been echoed across medicine, public health. I think there's great power within the relationship of a caregiver and child, and that that leads us into leaning in and actually trusting parents more. Um, that there's an enormously important message for us as professionals um, to sort of keep at the forefront of our minds and always and consistently. Um, this powerful message resonated for me mostly as a professional, but also quite honestly, that wasn't in my bio, but I'm also a mother of three. I have twins and a singleton um, who are only 18 months apart. And it's very humbling, no matter how many degrees you have, or even as a physician, I'm trained in, in pediatrics, um, to the look in the face of a new life that you have full and total responsibility for and be reminded that you're an expert, not because of the degrees or even your pediatric training, but because you're uniquely gifted to connect um, to this life, this little life and these little lives for me, um, that I think is something every parent, every caregiver in the life of a young child should be reminded of often. And I think it's the opportunity we have across as systems actors um, to do that alongside of um, caregivers. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me in this place. I'm so honored to be here. Um, when I think about early relational health, I think about the positive interactions and communication verbally and non-verbally that are reciprocated 
that builds trust, safe, supportive, nurturing environments for healthy child development, development, in my case, healthy family development. Initially, what brought me to this work was the traumatic experiences my son had while continuously advocating for himself in school while being bullied because he has Tourette syndrome. I advocated for him too. My voice was being dismissed. I had no support system, no knowledge of special education laws, resources, or programs, while at the same time I was fighting for him to keep him in a devastating court battle representing myself. We were frozen in life and I was on survival mode. As a mother, I decided to reach out to perform care. They came out to my house. They were so kind and caring. I'm sorry, I'm just reflecting back. They were so kind and caring. I was scared at first, but because they were so kind and caring and non-judgmental and took the time to speak to us individually to understand what had happened and what was going on, hearing our voices and gave us a tool called a 504 plan that protects individuals with disability. I took that information to his doctors that protects, I'm sorry, I took that information to his doctors. His doctors were so kind, caring and understanding. They met us where we were at, hearing both of our voices, understanding what had happened to us, asking him what he needs to best support him in school. And as well as me speaking to me in that matter, the doctors then created accommodations in the 504 plan around it. The doctors not only helped my son, but helped me too each month when my son had his appointments. She used a two generational approach. Although things didn't work out um, at his school, I put my son in a new school and night turned into day. He started to thrive in and out of school. I then started to invest my son in various programs in and out of school and agencies in the community while I volunteered there. I also began outreaching in my community, encouraging families, hearing their voices while advocating their concerns. I'm sorry, I was looking at the chat. <laughs> while advocating um, their voices on boards and com committees. Secondly, my own journey in my life um, is the reason why I'm deeply passionate about the work that I do. From being in a car accident, leaving me with a traumatic brain injury, being told I was crazy and stupid all of my life, that I would never amount up to anything by my single parent mother, then being molested by her boyfriend and being told um, that she needed the money and what, what did she want me to do? Um, moreover, being physically abused by her boyfriend. I was depressed. I, I was a depressed teenager acting out, which created hardships for me in my life. Then in adulthood, dealing with the death of my ex-husband, raising two children alone, an eight-year-old and an eight-month-old. Later, pregnant with my third child, falling back into a depression after a breakup of a relationship and a high-risk pregnancy alone with no support system again many hardships in my now, my life. Now raising one minor child because I dealt, my two adult children are out of the house, married and have a beautiful little six month old baby. Still, um, I'm raising a minor child alone with no help or break. I'm sorry if I went off to you, but I just wanted to share that. And what resonated with me I'm sorry if I got off track a little bit. I'm nervous. Thank you so much, Lavanya, for sharing for sharing your journey, your experiences with us today. We we can't be more grateful. Um, and uh, uh, Monique, thank you so much. I really loved how you talked about being the expert, not because you were a pediatrician, but because you were the mother with the capacity for a unique relationship. Um, the second question that I wanted to address to both of you was, um, what were your initial reactions to this report, the ERH principles uh, report? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? 
How, what felt different from the other kinds of guidance we've received in the early childhood field? Well, truthfully, uh, my initial reaction to this report was yes. Um, I was, I was really truly excited and hopeful. Um, I can assure you that there are, aren't many government reports or even non-governmental reports that I read and actually cheer about, but this report was, was actually different. And I think the excitement was sort of born out of what was actually shared in the report and more importantly, what it means to each and every family, their communities, the professionals and the systems that come alongside of them as they give birth and raise healthy children. It was clarity um, and it was strength and it was hopeful. I loved where Jen Lee left us. It was hopeful. And even in hearing Livonia's story um, and her resilience and her moving through, there is a sense of that there is hope there. Um, and the, the, for me, there were sort of three main things that sort of um, engendered that excitement about this report. The focus on, on the benefits of ERH um, to birthing people, caregivers, and young children, remembering that it's not just about the child, um, but also this um, the dyad the, and the systems. It's an important message for families of young children. It sort of makes clear the value of each member of this dyad in the ERH, that it's not just the child. The child does not exist alone, um, but there is a system of supports and caregivers that come alongside of. It's also the intentional effort to not blame or a center in or in a deficit-based narrative of caregivers and young, young children. This is a huge um, shift for us and we're still in the middle of that shift. I don't think that we've completely shifted yet, but we're in the process of sort of shifting the narrative back to identifying and focusing in on strengths. And Jun Lee sh um, shared with you sort of the idea of the positive, um, uh, you know, instead of ACEs, how we're focusing in on what are the positive things that sort of balance out that, um, that, uh, um, that scale. Um, there's a great quote in the report that says that all parents want to, are capable of and strive to care for their children's needs. I love that quote and that framing. The second thing is, is that while the report makes families the focal point, it also spans out to sort of address the external supports that are necessary for families, necessary for Livonia, as she shared with us, um, to be successful and to reach goals. It was clear that we can't and shouldn't forget that every family like Livonia has their unique, specific and varied needs. Um, the report sort of brings into focus the role of systems and structures in supporting families and coming alongside of them. And some of those that were um, mentioned around pediatric providers, childcare, doulas, um, and even programs like the program where I sit, the Federal Home Visiting Program. And then the third thing that got me excited was really the role of equity sort of this cross-cutting a cut, a theme across all of the key areas. Again, identify, identifying that while some support may be necessary for all families, there are needs that are unique to families for a host of re reasons, whether that be economic status, ethnicity, cultural norms, um, racial bias, life experiences, disability, and even sort of the understanding of the in intersectionality of all of those needs and roles. Um, so the report does an excellent job for me of highlighting all of those areas. And thus um, is what led to sort of this exclamation of yes for me um, and being able to read it and understand it. Well, thank you for sharing that. My initial reaction was, wow, the path that brought my family from trauma to resilience has a name. After being told, I'm sorry if I'm saying it again, but this really, really reflects with me. After being told all my life that I was crazy, stupid, and I was a bad parent because I went against my cultural norms and separated myself from my family due to dysfunction, this report is so validating to me. It confirms that the path that I took, I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional because it really means a lot to me. The path that I took um, was the right path for me and my children. It encourages me to continue the work that I do. It also helps me understand how beneficial early relational health can be to the whole family and community. What Renaissance, what resonated with me in the report was the ecosystem model, the positive early relationship experiences, the support, the early relationship, relational health 
credit principle and the reciprocal benefits that the child and the parent receives from the mall. I lived it and I know it works. It really does take a village to raise a child. The agencies that created mutual trust and provided simple positive interactions who met us where we were at, at the fragile time in our lives and build that relationship to where we are thriving today really matters. Reflecting back during the time when I was on survival mode, frozen in life with no help or support system, it was the positive, compassionate, reciprocal interactions with various agencies from perform care to my son's doctor, his school, our neighborhood family success center, Camden County Council for young children when I was a parent leader before I turned into their project coordinator, um, um, the summer camp, our church that really changed the trajectory of my family's life, turning our trials into triumphs. And is the reason why I'm thriving and we are thriving here today. Um, what felt different was the focus on simple, positive daily interactions that can be so impactful. In other early relational health work, they focus on bigger issues, but sometimes it's the little ones that make the most impact and positive outcomes. Simply by asking, how best can we support you? It's all that it takes. Thank you. You're on mute, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I was just saying thank you so much, Lavanya, for that. I've been taking notes as you spoke. When you mentioned the positive, compassionate, reciprocal interactions, um, you know, those are things that we all should strive. Those are the kinds of interactions all of us should strive to have with all the families that we come across. So please know that this is so valuable. You're, you, the, you're raising your voice, you're uplifting the voices of others, families and communities, and we so appreciate that. And we're very, very, very grateful to you for that. Thank you so very much. Um, um, my next question is uh, for Monique. Could you share briefly how you envision the principles outlined in this report might influence and impact people working at a systems level? I know we're running a little bit short of time, but uh, it would be great to hear your answer to that question. Um, and, and thank you, Usha, and I'm, I'm cognizant of that. And um, I think um, hearing less of me and more of Livonia is probably what everybody wants to do. So I, I'll try to, to make this short. I think this is th this concept of ERH and moving them from sort of this wonderful, excited document to, um, to the impact where we see Livonia's and families like Livonia's being impacted. Um, and, um, you know, programs like the, the ones that we, where I sit on home visiting in our early childhood systems programs. And that, you know, many of us have shared today and the concept outlined this in the report are not new, but what they do is sort of bring again, all of this into alignment. And then, you know, just thinking about um, the work of that's already been laid, the foundation of infant mental health, um, around and then bringing those together with efforts around centering equity, um, ensuring that we're providing the right services to the right family at the right time, the work of Medicaid and child health um, transformational work, um, and sort of this amplified attention that we're now having post-pandemic um, to mental and behavioral health, um, I think is all things that we're able to build on. And that's work that we're doing in our federal home visiting program. Um, and thanks to, we're recently reauthorized uh, at a base funding of $500 million, which will been increasing over the um, subsequent years. Um, we support all 56 states, and Kay mentioned that, um, it alluded to that earlier. Um, 56 states and jurisdictions and U.S. territories in implementing voluntary evidence-based home visiting service to birthing people and families of young children and communities that sort of face these significant barriers um, to achieving po um, these positive outcomes and achieving their own goals. Um, and these principles of ERH are really being um, uh, in the early stages of being integrated into home visiting. 
And we're doing that through our um, continuous quality improvement work, um, helping to support states and their teams, doing sort of tests of change um, to see how um, early relational health can be integrated um, into one of our specific topical areas around caregiver child interaction. Um, and we're really in the early phases of doing that work. Um, but what ends up happening is, is we do that with a small group of um, states and their local implementing agencies. And then we're able to take that work um, and move that into spread and scale across a larger number of states um, and communities. And so we're really excited about the opportunities um, that lie um, in that work and using that as one mechanism for us to be able to bring that alongside of um, home visiting work in particular. Thank you so much. It's great to hear about what's happening and the possibilities. Uh, Lavanya, I have another question for you. Um, we know that you've been using your voice and you've been working with communities to raise families and parents' uh, voices up and uh, uh, bring you know, services to, to communities and, and so on. Um, so we, I'd like to ask you, trusting parents and meeting parents where they are, are the two Core, one of some of the two core principles highlighted in this report. Um, could you share examples of how these principles have played out in your work as a parent leader? What are the impacts that you've seen with, with the application of these principles? You're muted, Lavanya. Technology, gotta love it. <laughs> Thank you. Trusting parents, mom, trusting parents know that they're, I mean, trusting parents know their child best. Understanding that they want what's best for their children, even though they may be struggling and are having a difficult time. Meeting them where they are at could be by actively listening, understanding what's going on in their life without judgment, validating them, providing encouragement. That could make a world of a difference. Other times, it may look like helping families who are struggling with lack of childcare, food insecurity, or who may be dealing with um, domestic violence have the resources and or information about programs to help them and following up with them to see if they use it. An example of the work that I do, I'm the project coordinator for Camden County Council for Young Children. We use the village theory there. Our mission is to strengthen the collaborations between parents as active partners with service providers and community leaders, helping sorry, went off track again, helping them to identify the needs, concerns, and aspirations and successes are of our collective efforts to posit positively impact the health, education, and well-being of birthing individuals and children from ages zero to age eight. Parent caregivers voice their concerns, community service providers provide presentations about their services and programs with resources, community and parent leaders advocate for um, change in early childhood systems. We listen to the voice of the parents, caregivers and provide presentation trainings and resources to support them. In addition, we advocate their needs on other platforms and committee and boards or through our agency, the Community Planning and Advocacy Council for system change, creating community solutions so families can thrive. Some of the changes that parents, caregivers advocated for on our council work workshops on understanding childcare, we provided a workshop from Camden County Children's Services that discussed the childcare program overview with understanding the childcare process, eligibility requirement, documentations that needed and services that they provide. Another advocated service was a better understanding of the Healthy Women's Healthy Families new program overview. A presentation was provided in detail about connecting NJ, doulas, community health workers, breastfeeding. We also constructed Camden County Council for Young Children meetings for core partner updates to report out vital information about their programs as of November, 2023 to inform parents about new program development and or changes. Another example of the work that I do, I'm the Family Voice Subcommittee Chair of Camden County Children's Interagency Coordinating Council. The Camden County Children's Interagency Coordinating Council is a county-based planning and advisory group composed of families, individuals, 
from government, private agencies, and the community that advises the County Department of Children and Families, the Division of Children's Systems of Care regarding children and youth with serious emotional, behavioral health, intellectual developmental disabilities, and substance abuse challenges. The Family Voice Subcommittee makes recommendation to advise the full Camden County Children and Interagency Coordinating Council. We provide program presentation awareness. We use the village circle to also hear matters. Then we have work groups to identify what's working, what's not working, brainstorm to come up with solutions to make recommendations on how to make perform care, New Jersey Children's System of Care, work better for who it was created for, families. Some of the system changes that were advocated for was culturally competent and sensitive workers, parents not knowing how to navigate the children's system of care trainings, parents not having transportation to get the services, being out of town, inappropriate services, services being dropped and or the lack of follow-up. We also email parents and caregivers resources to support them that were discussed during our village circle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lavanya. Um, we've run out of time for uh, to have too many questions, but I would like to address one question for Junlei, to Junlei. Um, what do you hope the ERH principles report contributes uh, towards children, families, and communities? I think that's exactly what I was hoping to share. Uh, in relation to Lavania's work in developing the report, you know, uh, Lavania had told us about not just her story, but her active work in the community. And traditionally, when we focus only on large programs, we often overlook the kind of work that happens at the grassroots level by community leaders and advocates, precisely like Lavania. So our hope is that in addition to thinking about here are the programs that could help, here are the well-known programs that can help, we can think about what are all the efforts from the pediatric offices to the communities, settings, and to all the places in and around families that embody the principles of early relational health. And I think it's a shift of thinking from merely thinking about fidelity to someone else's program to thinking about embodying integrity to the principles that make early relational health so important. And I think both approaches are important to be able to recognize, to fund, to support the wide array of efforts that meets family where they are. And I think Lavania's work is just the perfect example for that. Thank you so much. I love that, what you just said about uh, you know, we focus a lot on fidelity, but the integrity to those principles is, is key and it's important. Thank you so much for your insights. Uh, as many people have mentioned in the comments, as well as uh, in verbally, you uh, have a way of framing things in a way that's easy to understand, catchy, that stays with us, that motivates us. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to thank all the other speakers that we've had today. This has been amazing. Um, thank you for sharing your views, your perspectives, and having this really important, meaningful, and rich discussion with us. We are so sorry that we don't have the time to take on any more questions, but we will be sure to uh, answer, uh, to connect with you via email to answer those questions as best as we can. Um, and you will uh, hear from us uh, in the next few weeks for um, about the next webinar, as we had mentioned before. Um, and you will also, um, um, you know, the, the website for the Nurture Connection, uh, uh, it, Nurture Connection is on your screen here. So feel free to sign up for the Nurture Connections newsletter at that, uh, at the website. Um, and um, again, many thanks to all our wonderful speakers. Um, and the audience for being here today. 
Um, I hope that this can inspire all of us to reflect on how we can strengthen the work that we are already doing by braiding together these simple principles into every aspect of the work. Here's to all of us joining hands and contributing to an ecosystem that supports all children and all families. Thank you so much.